My name's Tricky Walsh and I'm a contemporary artist in Hobart. My practice is, is mainly sort of architectural and spatial and I work a lot with model making. I mainly work at what I perceive the problem that, to be and find a solution so I don't, I don't adhere to one particular medium. My name is Mish Myers and my solo practice is mixed media and I'm interdisciplinary. My solo practice is primarily concerned with ideas of communication with an edge of kind of absurdity. I guess in its current form, we've been collaborating for seven or eight years. Yeah, so we have a primary project, Henry, um, who yeah. has made a fictional character. and That's an ongoing collaborative project. But we also, in a broader sense as well, we've worked on multiple collaborative projects. And so um, projects that have included theatre and puppetry. That are not and ongoing. No, so one-off things. We started working together, I think, because artists quite often work in isolation and you know, it's kind of tough, actually, if you don't have a constant stream of opportunities or exhibitions or anything to keep going to. So I think that we just kind of pushed ourselves and made up this other whole sort of stream of practice to just keep working, mainly. In a larger sense, um, I probably bring spatial things to Misha's materiality, and that's the connecting point. I think there are some overarching threads. It's always looking at systems and trying to actually reinvent systems because the art, art world can be quite conservative and it's that idea of re-looking at that stuff and busting it open. I think we both really like museums. Whenever we go travelling, one of the first places we seem to end up is like Natural History Museum or... They're places that have the raw materials of inspiration, so they're not coloured by someone's perspective, they're not touched by somebody else's hand so much, they're just sort of pure, um, you know, data. The Natural History Museum, when they were um, setting it up, there's beautiful photographs where they're making the armatures for all of their enormous creatures. And there's one particular image that's of a stingray and it's enormous, but it's all made out of timber and it's quite before. geometric before they coat it and, and set dress it. I so guess. this work is very much a homage to that. So it's kind of a machine or it's a creature and it's not complete to the point where you don't get to use your imagination anymore. I think we want people to get a whiff of a little bit of that kind of dinosaur, it's a little bit of a machine, it's a little bit of a, like we're really interested in keeping it shifting and ambiguous. So this is kind of like a, a pure machine that takes the contents of the museum and distills it through its workings and you know it has some sort of outcome, we're not privy to it, but it's just, it's kind of like, you know, this overarching thing that just sits in witness to all of the things that have been collected by, you know, throughout history by people. It's pretty rare to make a large scale permanent work like this, because normally we make installation and it's up for six weeks or all. It can stop working and you just go and fix it, but this, you know, has to be out there for 15 years. Yeah, with no maintaining and that's actually yeah, it was kind really of challenging. challenging. <laughs> yeah. We went through a process of basically kind of going, well, I kind of wanted to be like this and then finally cemented on something that was actually quite simple. So then from there we sort of started sketching up, well, you know, I personally like this kind of aesthetic, so then we argued about that and then eventually it all kind of fit together. We came up with the designs um, and we made a little model, which actually has been incredibly helpful. So normally we would not do a model. That's not a standard practice, but for this particular work we did because um, we had to do a presentation for it to be okayed before we could make it. Whereas our normal process... It's way more intuitive and, you know, one thing leads to another thing and there's an evolution and there's a freedom in that, you, you know, you kind of trust the idea enough to kind of go, well, it's going to change and that's okay, but we had to lock everything in before even touching the material, which is actually really quite difficult. The materials for this particular project were very much also driven by the fact that it had to last for 10 to 15 years. So everything has to be engineer approved and you have to take everything through this 
fairly bureaucratic process that you don't normally engage with with art. We didn't actually outsource that much stuff. We only outsourced the metal core that everything because it had to be at a to. particular rating and other, and you know. um, the glass being blown because I don't have those skills or the equipment. And we've made everything else, so we've done all the wood and everything ourselves. Tricky and I are very much invested in the actual mark making and and the the imperfections that you get from a person making something mm -hmm. with their hands. My main thing was that I wanted to be able to shift the scale from sort of standard domestic framing all the way into sort of macro scale in a seamless way. So we've basically whitewashed, lime washed all the wood as well to take on this kind of scale model look. What I've done is I've made um, small discrete artworks um, to be housed in these vessels. They're more abstract ideas of collections. So initially I started off with the ideas based on museum collections. Biological, geological, man-made and botanical. So those kind of major collections um, that I, I identified as interest areas for me. So my interest wasn't actually replicating it because again, it's an artwork. It's not about replicating what's already existing. I did actually have a few issues going, maybe I should just have objects, and then I was like, no, 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 it's an artwork. So it's that process of peeling away and kind of refining and defining um, what you really mean, and often that happens by making. I like to batten down the hatches and make the work, and I don't I really don't want to hear anything from you anyone. You don't even like me no. going, I think we should change. And no. she's like, no! <laughs> um, even just the way that you actually work, you sit down at your table and you sit there for eight hours and work and work and work. And I do like to shift and change things just to look and then kind of go, okay, is that going to happen? And then I need to leave for the day and give it 24 hours and come back with fresh eyes. I have little things that I know are going to change or I know they're going to adapt or you know even this has kind of evolved slightly just the reality of making a little model and then actually having to build it full scale is just like things need to change. But ultimately you can be the writer and you can be the director to a point and then the artwork tells you what it wants um, and you know it's so clearly it needs that or it needs that. I think I'm looking forward to installing it. I think it'd be really nice. It will be the first time that we see it complete, mm. which will be interesting. Because we designed it in pieces, because we knew the doorways were sort of smallish, we had to um, get a truck. And we brought it in and it was quite easy, that bit. And then we knew there were, there were stages, so we had to bolt everything to the frame and then we have to fix everything else to that, basically. So there was always a plan of action of how we would approach each bit. So the logistics of it were we had to work on it to, to a certain point and then the rigger came along um, to hoist it in the air. You got it up into the air and it was horrible. <laughs> it wasn't horrible, there was it just kind of looked wrong. There was bending and no noises but feelings and so basically one of the elements started to bend so we brought it back down again because we didn't want to kill anyone and, um, <laughs> and then it sat on sawhorses for a couple of weeks while so. they refabricated the pieces. So basically now instead of this beautiful white aluminium frame, there's a massive channel of solid steel running pretty much the whole way through the thing. In arts actually, sometimes when, thing, when you fail, you learn the most. And also I yeah. think it, it, there's a... Creativity comes out of problem solving as yeah. well, you know, so that's good. Yeah, and I mean the integrity of the artwork, it still looks exactly yeah, as we it intended. Still looks the same. I see something that was about this big suddenly be that big and that's quite satisfying in a weird way. I think we knew what it would look like but we didn't quite know how it would feel in its finished thing and that, that's a really nice resolution point to kind of go this thing that we planned for so long and had taken so long to make 
finally we can actually just see it in the space it was designed to be in. And that's really satisfying. I hope that people are still inspired by it or are hope, inspired by it. I hope it's like I feel when I go to, I grew up in Melbourne, when I have a favourite work or a friend, becomes a friend that you revisit, that you grew up with. And so in a way we've tried to keep that in mind that um, to not be too flash in the pan, what's hot right now, like make it fluorescent. Something a know. little more classical, I guess, or timeless, maybe. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.